Hail and well met, Traveler. Welcome to the Tavern. Did you know this is the place where more than half of the greatest adventures in history have begun? But before those adventurers took their first steps, they watched and calculated who would join their party. Why look over there? There's a mighty barbarian from the Frozen Lands. Strong, mighty, full of honor and wisdom. I happen to know that one. They go by Matt Rossi. And look over there to the right. That woman working away on her mechanical dog. She's cunning, witty, and I've seen her bounce more than her fair share of ne'er-do-wells out of here before I can even blink. I happen to know that she goes by the name Liz Harper. And me? Oh, my name's Joe Perez. And I'll be your tavern key. Welcome to Tavern Walk. Hello and welcome to Tavern Watch, a roundtable freeform discussion about, well, tabletop gaming. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Joe Perez. Uh, we I write about board game stuff sometimes, not as often as I'd like, but sometimes. Uh, and I am joined with my wonderful co-host today, uh, Liz Harper, who also happens to be uh, a burgeoning GM uh, and <laughs> uh, now a great player with uh, GM experience. Uh, how are you doing today, Liz? Ah, uh, doing all right. Doing all right. All right. Uh, and we have my uh, the yin to my yang, Matt Rossi, uh, who uh, is also going to be sharing a body with me in our upcoming game, which we're going to talk about a little bit, a little bit later. How are you doing today, Matt? I'm just interested to know how we determined that I'm the yin. It's it's interesting to think about because you know, uh, no, never mind. We'll, we can move on and talk about <laughs> games instead. That, I was going to start talking probably... all about Taoism here and the the true Tao and how yin and yang fit into that, but I'm cool. That, oh. that could be a whole podcast by itself, so. It really could. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to go ahead and go through some tabletop news, uh, some some notable events uh, or things that have happened in the, the recent weeks or things that are going to be coming up. Uh, first up, we're going to do some Wizards of the Coast news because there is a bunch of that lately. Uh, so first thing that I noticed, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, uh, that Wizards of the Coast has opened up their 2022 Retail Improvement Grant application. Are you guys familiar with that at all? I'm uh, I'm not. I was hoping you could explain it to me. I've literally never you... heard of it before you sent us this telling us that it was yeah. happening. So they, they do this thing where they actually have funds set aside for stores to become pre, premier Wizards of the Coast stores. So these are stores that uh, sell all of the product, are pushed as like actual almost like brick and mortar stores for Wizards of the Coast, uh, where they, you know, if you were to go to their website and say, where can I buy your stuff? They're going to list it there, not just a regular local store. And it has to live up to a certain amount of standards when it comes to play space cleanliness uh, and things that it can offer. So years ago, in order to help businesses uh, that are interested in becoming those types of premier stores uh, come up to those standards, Wizards opened up a grant where they will cover up to half of the the cost. And this is a grant, not a, not a loan or anything like that. So if they need better infrastructure or remodeling or furniture or even personnel is covered under this as well, which I thought was really an interesting thing that uh, you don't hear a lot from other game companies. Um, it's like, yes, we will give you some money to help you hire people so that you can staff your store to run events and do things with our product, which is really, really neat. Um, there, there's a, a little bit more like complicated stuff associated with it, with like how you maintain it and, and things like that. Uh, but it's interesting to see the, one of the biggest names in tabletop gaming actually doing something to make sure brick and mortar stores are, you know, staying open and running events and doing things. Yes, they're invested in it. Uh, and they, they, you know, that's how they make a, a, some of their money, but still being able to say here, here's some money to go buy new furniture. So you can actually have tables for people to play on. I think it's kind of okay. Uh, well, I mean, this is the thing that they brought in when they stopped having their own personal stores, right? Yeah. You're, you're I don't know just... if people remember this. Back in the, like, I'd say 2005, 2006, Wizards had a bunch of stores. Yeah, mostly on the West Coast, I think. Yeah, they had them up, up and down the West Coast. Uh, I lived in places where they had them. Uh, and they stopped doing that because, basically, 
it was more cost effective to not have your own stores and simply hook into the stores that already existed. Uh, I remember there was a big deal about a lot of lo- a lot of local gaming stores were really upset that Wizards had their own stores because it was competition from Wizards itself to on retail on the retail front. Mm-hmm. So this is what they came up with to replace that. I had not heard about it in years, so I was surprised that it's still going, but apparently it still is. Yeah, and um, I think they did it last year. I don't think they did it in 2020 uh, because that was just a, a weird roller coaster of a year. Uh, and right now it's for the U.S., Canada, and Japan. So, yeah, I thought it was interesting. Liz, any comments? I mean, we see a lot of people getting into D&D because of streams these days because mm-hmm. there are some really popular streams out there like Critical Role and just tons more, but Critical Role is like the 800-pound gorilla in that market. Um but the tabletop experience is so important to d and I mean, I play D&D almost exclusively online because I got a lot of buddies that are all over the country. So you play online because that's, that's how you can play. But being at a table together and, you know, having your miniatures and seeing everyone's faces, that's, that can be a really crucial part of the experience. That can be a big part of, you know forming friendships with people and understanding what they're trying to do. Cause sometimes when you don't see someone's face, it's harder to mm. tell where they're going. So I think it is, I think it's a great thing that wizards recognizes that and recognizes that they need to support spaces where that can happen. Because if there aren't friendly open spaces with events and room to do this stuff, you can't, it's harder to get into it. And the lifeblood of any company is helping new people get into their game. So, uh, yeah, I think it's great that they're helping out local game stores and keeping the brick and mortars alive because that is really important. Yeah, I will say in defense of other companies that don't do this, I can't think of another role playing game yeah. company that is owned by a multi billion dollar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, one hundred percent. So, so yeah. it isn't. It isn't reasonable to expect other companies to do this. However, I, it is still a good thing. It's a good thing for everybody. Yeah. If local brick and mortar stores stay open, even if it is wizards who benefits most from it, it, it's a benefit to others as well. So the interesting thing about it too, is it can also start to cover things talking about like the digital age with, uh, well, like Liz brought up where we play a lot of the stuff online. Uh, you could actually looking at the categories where they have like the, you know, design infrastructure, things like that. A lot of that can actually be used for stores that are starting to try to do things like get up a streaming service or do a a matchmaking service for people that are playing from uh, remotely. So if they can't play in the store, so there's things there that smaller stores can also leverage that they might not have been able to before, because we've all known that there's like there's been small stores that maybe have like one or two tables. They don't have a whole lot of play space because it's mainly mainly used to retail uh, and retail is expensive. If you're going to be paying rent for it, trust me, it is very expensive if you haven't looked into it. And so being able to use maybe some of that to buy maybe a computer to stream or to uh, pay for hosting services so that you can actually have people find games through your store's website. Hey, come in and buy a book. And hey, by the way, go to our website. We can you know, match you with people that want to play and you guys can play online until it's safe to play in store. Like there's ways that they can leverage that now to, to embrace sort of the digital era of uh, role playing that has sort of uh, become the normal. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of excited about that too, but I think that's enough about that, but because that's not the only wizards of the coast rule uh, news we've seen. Uh, we did actually also see that they're getting a brand new president, uh, which is coming from, uh, well, Microsoft, which happens to be in the news quite a lot lately. Uh, so Cynthia Williams, uh, formerly of Microsoft, is going to be uh, the new president of Wizards of the Coast because the former president, Chris uh, Chris Cox, is being moved to the CEO of Hasbro because that's a, a big up move for him. Uh, so I think that's really interesting. She was, I believe, the general manager and vice president for the gaming eco uh, ecosystem and commercial team. Uh, so she has a lot of experience doing, well, Xbox gaming, uh, and accelerating game, game creator growth. And I'm wondering what that's going to mean for a new Wizards of the Coast that's under her, under her direction. Any opinions? Yeah. I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it means for the long term. It is interesting that they've gone to a technology company because again, like we were just saying, streaming is a really big part of D&D and digital tools are a big part of helping people learn the game and get into the game. So the more you can integrate with these kind of streams and the smoother you can make this 
online experience, both of playing and learning about the game, you know, the better the company is doing. But I, I do not know this new CEO, and I'm not familiar with what they've been working on. So it's, it's just, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell if I'm going to change direction, do new exciting things. Mm. We'll see. I think the other interesting thing, too, is there's a new vice president as well, a senior vice president mm-hmm. uh, and, and general manager coming in specifically for the digital gaming side of Wizards of the Coast. Uh, so Tim Fields is also coming in as well. And That's interesting because they hired Todd Kenrick. Yeah. D&D hired uh, formerly of um, D&D Beyond, actually. Mm-hmm. Todd Kenrick, they hired him over to do their videos. You know how they, they used to, like the D&D Beyond would do interviews and so forth. Now D&D is doing their own. And they hired the guy from D&D Beyond to come over and do them. Yep. So that's interesting, too. I, I find myself wondering if they're planning on taking uh, D&D Beyond fully under themselves rather than have it be run by who it's run by right now. I uh, think which is Curse, I believe. I think it run is. by Fandom. 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 Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Fandom is currently who, the people who do D&D Beyond. And they're not, this is not me saying they're doing a bad job. Uh, far from it. I just find myself wondering if, if Hasbro slash D&D uh, slash wizards has decided to incorporate it directly um that would be interesting to see what would happen if they did that i wouldn't be surprised if they did honestly with because you have paizo's making their own right they're they're doing it even though they're going through a third party yeah. it's still going to be under their own uh we know that um magpie is doing theirs for avatar a bunch of other games have announced it as part of their like kickstarter runs the uh, vampire one is happening too the world of darkness one yep 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 So a lot of companies seem to be doing this and the difference between them and D and D beyond is D and D beyond is a third party company wholly and completely. Um, But I also wonder what that would mean if they bring it all in house. Does that mean that things like fantasy grounds uh, and roll 20 are going to get less content or are they going to try to push that? Are they going to try to make a replacement, not just for D and D beyond, uh, but are they going to make a replacement for those other options as well? Because D and D Beyond basically does everything that you can do in Roll Twenty that doesn't involve maps and tokens. So, mm-hmm. do they make something that does maps and tokens now and pull that into house and just have an entire experience where you sign in with your Wizards of the Coast uh, login, you have everything at your disposal right there, which is an interesting concept. I I use the app a lot personally because I play a lot of Magic: The Gathering. And all of their magic content, literally, and every event that they run is done through this app. Uh, all of everything for match pairing, it, nothing's left up to the the organizers. It's all done automatically through the app in the back end, um, as well as like life totals and things like that, which is, you know, it's good, but it could always be expanded. So I'm kind of curious about that as well. The other thing is I'm wondering how they're going to handle game licensing going forward as well, uh, because you have somebody who's very used to doing like first party game holding. Uh, and especially somebody who was uh, part of that Xbox banner that brought everything under Xbox and Game Pass. Does that mean we're going to see less games getting licensed out, less Dark Alliances, less uh, Baldur's Gates? Or are those still going to be a thing? Or are they going to try to open up their own internal studio to make those games? Which I think at one point they did way back in the day. I don't remember. They tried to, but it didn't actually produce any games. Yeah. Um I've actually been been reading up on the the period of time right after Interplay and Black Isle Games closed and BioWare decided they didn't want to do licensed stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. There was actually a, a period of, this was back when Atari was involved. Um, I don't know if you know that, but for a while there, Atari was the company that was doing uh, D&D games. Mm-hmm. And Atari had the license for, uh, I think Neverwinter Nights 2. Yes. And then they did it. I forget what company that actually did it for them. It wasn't Atari. But as a result of all that stuff, you saw ended up with like two different Dungeons and Dragons MMOs. Like there was Dungeons and Dragons Online and then there was the uh the one that's still going, Neverwinter. I actually don't know if Dungeons and Dragons Online is still going or not, but I know Neverwinter is. Du- Dungeons and Dragons Online is still going, actually. Um yeah. Never Neverwinter technically wasn't an MMO. Yeah, it is now. Yeah. Uh, but regardless, all that stuff, the complicated license holding, that's the reason that some games, like, it took something like 12 years for the original Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance to come back out uh, because of the complicated who owns the rights to this situation. Same with Icewind that's, Dale. Yeah. Um, Icewind Dale, in fact, is still not entirely clear. Yeah. They just did Icewind Dale, and I don't know if they've done Icewind Dale 2. Uh, a remaster of it or not. I know there was talk about it, but I don't remember if they did it or not. There's been a lot of confusion about that stuff. I can, I can certainly imagine wizards of the coast wanting to try and pull it all together, especially since Hasbro is now finally 
realized what they own. Like for <laughs> for a decade now, Hasbro has had no idea what they owned. They just owned it so they could get their hands in the Pokemon license. Yep. And then they lost the Pokemon license because it ran out. And then they were like, what do we do with this? I don't know. Well, let's just let it alone. See what happens. And now they're like, and that was actually probably the best thing that could have happened for both, you know, for Wizards of the Coast and for Hasbro. Oh yeah. So now that people from Wizards are actually getting promoted to CEO of the entire company and Hasbro has noticed Wiz- Wizards and is going to be more interested in exploiting them. And I'm sorry, there was an old cartoon. I think it was Penny Arcade where they, they said, you know, exploiting, you know, that doesn't sound great. What if I said diddled instead? That is, no, no, go back to exploited. I like it now. That is kind of <laughs> how it feels sometimes when you, you hear these corporations saying, we want to exploit our core synergies. You're like, what does that mean? That doesn't sound right. But in this particular case, with with somebody coming over whose previous jobs were Microsoft and Amazon mm-hmm. to, to, to run Wizards, uh, I think it is very unlikely they are not planning to do some di- heavy digital moves. It just there's there's no other reason to hire someone with that pedigree. I, I think and, I think at best I think we could see them. Or I shouldn't even say best or worst. I think the least that I, we would see them do is find a way to not necessarily consolidate licensing, but to have a better licensing structure because they don't really oh, yeah. seem to have one right now. They don't. They have the, the legacy of the past twenty years of D and D licensing is almost as bad as Marvel's was before Disney got them. Mm-hmm. Like, remember how, like, they couldn't make various characters, they couldn't make their own movies of various characters because they'd sold the rights. That's why we got an Iron Man movie, because literally nobody else was available. They'd sold the Fantastic (laughs) Four, they'd sold the X-Men, they'd sold Spider-Man. The only license they had was Iron Man. Yep. And that's why Iron Man became this enormous movie, because it was literally, this is what we got. You know, we can make a movie of this. So, it is, the D&D licensing situation for video games is extremely, like, I think I'm, I'm, I don't remember what Japanese company owns it, but some company still owns the rights to Mistara. The shadows over. Oh, do you guys ever see the shadow over Mistara cabinet? Yeah, I, I actually game? I have a I have a digital version of it because they released it not too long ago. Yeah, it's still. I think it might be Konami. I honestly don't know, but somebody still owns it, and it's just it's just crazy how complicated the the rights are to D and D video games. So yeah, I could definitely see them working to make that more clear. Uh, the other thing is that Microsoft is going to buy Hasbro. That's a joke, <laughs> but it's not. If you tell me, you would be surprised. I mean, let's see. Let's let, let's see what we what do we just see with Blizzard? Uh, person from Microsoft leaves Microsoft to go work at Blizzard, uh, gets a massive position of power, and then Microsoft buys Activision Blizzard. Yeah. All right. We see a person who was very high up in the Microsoft rankings leaving Microsoft to go join Hasbro. Or sorry, Wizards of the Coast as uh, their new president. Uh, six months. <laughs> uh, if, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be surprising. Although, I mean, even if the worst case scenario, if all we get is literally all of the old arcade games available on Game Pass, I would be fine too. <laughs> if there was some backhand deal where they like, here you go, we can have this, and it's all on, happens to be on Game Pass, I'm fine with that too. Yeah, that's. That would not be shocking, but yeah, this is interesting in terms of lateral movements. I mean, one of the things we often forget is that Wizards of the Coast is in Renton, Washington. Yes. Yeah. yeah I used to live there. I used to live in, in, in Kirkland, just up the, oh, the way you ever see all those weird products, like no name products made with Kirkland on them. They're that's like they're from, made. yeah, that's where they're made from in Kirkland, Washington. I used to live there uh, and I got married there actually. And the, the house I got married at belong to a couple friends of mine, one of whom worked at Wizards and the other one who worked at uh, the Pokemon company and still does. Uh, so yeah, that, that was the kind of crowd I was running with at the time. Um, so yeah, it, it is, it's, she basically just went across the street. <laughs> like for all that, this is a big move to a completely different industry. She, she has probably not having even had to move Yeah, because her, her place would have been in the area that like Renton is just, it's right there. Uh, they are, they are not far from each other at all. So the, that's that's interesting to me too. And I have heard rumblings from some other folks that interact with uh potentially the game side of like Hasbro Watsi that they're kind of watching this to see what is potentially going to change with deals that are already in place uh or are being worked on currently. So we might see more news about this coming out in the future. Uh, and especially going back to one of Matt's points, they don't have they have access to everything that Hasbro owns. 
and think about if they have a game studio or they have something that handles all the licensing for the Wizards of the Coast site and it does well, they have things like My Little Pony and Transformers and uh, I think they currently own G.I. Joe, I want to say. It's been a while. Um, I'm pretty sure Hasbro owns G.I. Joe, yeah. Yeah, so they have all these things that are starting to become popular again, uh, massively popular again, that could then start to see better gaming licensing or better digital content all being passed through the same sort of structure. Well, this is unrelated to role-playing games, but it might be related to what we're talking about. Well, there's a Transformers role-playing game coming out. That's why I'm bringing it up. Yeah, uh, but, but also everything but... Um, I think everything, even including Transformers now, is there. They had comic licenses with uh, with IDW, the publishing and bo- company, and Boom, IDW, yeah, and, boom. and Boom. They're taking all their rights away from those companies. Mm-hmm. They're consolidating all their rights. I don't know why, and I don't know where they're going with it. But it's interesting to see that they're making moves like that in a, with their other properties. So right, well, we've talked about that a lot. Uh, just something to keep your eye on, especially if you're interested in this type of uh, environment. The last thing that we were going to talk about from Wizards of the Coast, I mean, I shouldn't say that. We'll, we'll probably talk about other things related to it. <laughs> but the last newsworthy thing uh, is that, well, there was a new box set that came out. We talked about this a little bit briefly. Liz, do you want to talk about uh, Morgan Canons and uh, its availability and maybe some of the shortcomings that we've seen with it? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we have Morgan Canon Presents. What is it called? Uh, the Manual of Monster- Monsters, Monsters to Multiverse. The Multiverse. Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah, there are two Morgan King books out and it just, it gets mixed up in my head. Um, so this is, it's an interesting book because it's like hard to define. It kind of brings together stuff we've seen in previous monster books and updates it. And it brings together a lot of races that we've seen in external books into one single source. So you don't have to buy a dozen adventure books to have information about all of these races. It's just all in this new Morgan Kanan's book. But uh, the real problem here is that it was released in a collector set that also includes a couple of other books. And um, like, that's the only way to get it is if you buy this $160, $170 collector set of books, which is a good deal if you don't own all the books in the collector set, but it's not a good deal if you just want this new Morgan Kanan's book with the updates. And- we should clarify a little bit. The, the books that are included in this box set besides Morton Kanan's are Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and Xanatar's Guide to Everything. Yeah, so it's kind of, it's it's a rules expansion collection. These are all kind of the big rule books that have expanded on the primary uh, player's handbook and DM's guide. So it's, it is nice to have them all collected together. But uh, right now, there is no other way to get the Morton Kanan book without spending $160 on this box set, which is uh, kind of problematic because uh, you can't buy it digitally. You can't buy it standalone. Personally, my opinion is that this was probably done because of printing problem because it is hard Mm -hmm. to get physical product. And I think one thing that kind of supports that theory is that some copies of Morton Canaan's have been seriously, (laughs) hideously misprinted. They are a mess. We had one of our own writers uh, in a bookstore and, uh, the Morgan Cannon's book, it on the spine of it, Monsters was misspelled. Interesting. It had two ends. Real quickly, interesting. Like I started looking into that a little bit more. Apparently, yeah. It, the the misprints are only really happening on the non-white spines. Yeah, I've seen pictures of the. Um, so, so yeah, there's the fancy, kind of a, it's the fancy cover then. The fancy no, no it's the, the fancy non-fancy cover, fancy cover, the non-fancy one. Like it's almost like they took like the offcuts that would normally not be like accepted that wouldn't have gotten through QA, and instead of like finishing them as like collectors have put them as a slip slightly subpar and just ship them out. Mm, so Well, I, because uh, our writer who found this misprint and I've seen co- pictures of it online as well. And I've seen people reporting that there are pages missing inside the book Oof. or that there are double printed pages. So you have two copies of the same page instead of one page and the next page. And I don't know how reliable all of that is, but I've seen a lot of reports and yeah, one of our own writers went in and saw this typo on the spine, but he also saw copies that do not have this typo on the spine, mm-hmm. which to me that speaks of a rushed printing process or a low par printing process or a printing process where QA did not review these books and they got shipped out well, when they really shouldn't have. You know what I wonder? I'm, I'm going back to when we talked with uh, with Brendan Conway and they mentioned mm-hmm. that like when they were planning to do their printing, they they were 
printing so much that they couldn't find anywhere in North America to print the books. They had to go elsewhere. I'm wondering yeah. if there's a case with that too, where like we're starting to see, I, I don't want to say paper shortages, but like printing companies might be going through like either supply chain issues or they might, they might be going with different uh, production houses and they might have different standards and rushing them on top of that. So like, if you don't have a QA in place, you can't do it, but you have to meet deadlines and you're getting them in a slow trickle from all parts of the world. I wonder if that plays into it as, as well. Yeah. I mean, that's what I feel. It's like some kind of supply chain issue and that we just, they didn't, they couldn't get enough books to do a standalone printing. Um, and I mean, we have quality control issues, even with these, uh, these big collector's editions, which are really expensive, $160 worth of books. Um, and, and it's also mostly compiled from other books, but one kind of interesting thing, and you pointed this out, Joe, is that, uh, in the new Mordenkainen's book, it's kind of streamlined spell casting for monsters. Yes. So there's uh, a lot about that, actually. Did you, do you want to go into that or do you want me to? Uh, why don't you go into it? Because I, I watched the video, but it's been a few days. OK, so there there's some key bullet points that are, are really like the big thing. So there was an interview with Jeremy Crawford uh, and talks about specifically spellcasting with monsters, because it's as a, as somebody who's been running games for a while, spellcasting with monsters can go one of two ways. Uh, it's either highly, highly effective and feels unfair or it does absolutely nothing and adds absolutely nothing to the the experience of fighting that monster. Uh, so they're looking at it and they're trying to find ways, specifically through Mordenkainen, and, and doing these 233 monster stat block changes, I think it was. Might be 253, I can't remember. It's a lot. Head. It's a lot. It, like it, that. That is a lot. It sounds like a lot, but in terms of like monster blocks or like the monster manual, that's a huge number of like revisions. Uh, but they want to make the game more fun. They want to make it easier to learn. Um, and they they call it shorting the pathway to getting to your bliss. It's basically trying to remove barriers from play. So I'll use an example like monsters uh, having legendary actions. There are DMs out there that don't use them. Uh, there are DMs out there that don't use legendary resistances, not because they choose not to. Some of them do. But it's because they don't know they can, because it's it's something that they missed inside of the text of the monster block, and it's really easy to do so. Or it's easy to forget about because the monster has a million things that it can do. So they're trying to streamline that, pare down the monsters to their essences a little bit more, and make them easier to, to learn and, and run. Um, also, one thing I wanted to point out mm -hmm. while we're talking about it. Uh, they've taken some things that were in the past not clear mm -hmm. and made it very clear this is not a spell. It's so it can't be counter spells. Yes. Uh, one of the things that he listed in the article I was reading is mind blast by a by a mind flare. Uh, if a mind flare uses mind blast, you can't just cast counter spell on it. It doesn't work that way because it's not a spell. Mm -hmm. It's it is it's debatably not even magic. Uh, if you want to do the whole psionics thing, but psionics and magic are the same in most versions of D and D nowadays. So, but it is not a spell. So you can't counterspell it. I think you could probably still interf interfere with it with, say, you know, anti-magic field. There's got, like yeah, that. there's ways that you could probably get around it, I'm sure. But but you can't. It just makes it easier to know, okay, uh, I've got a I've got a party with three spellcasters in it. What can my guy do about them counterspelling his abilities? Well, he doesn't have to worry about them counterspelling this one. So it is it is an interesting way to streamline that process. I think it also adds an element of danger too for a lot of that stuff as well. Because like I, I I talk about this occasionally. Like there are are encounters that I've played through as a player that should not have gone as smoothly for the players, at least in my opinion, as they did. Like it shouldn't have. It should have felt more dangerous. Like you know facing off against a, a beholder god should be a dangerous thing um and yet there are players that will steamroll that because of the way that abilities work and be specifically because of things like counter spell countering spells versus them being labeled as abilities i think that makes a huge difference uh but they also had a rumor going around that they were going to take away spell casting for monsters they're not doing that like matt pointed out they're just streamlining it um, they're also consolidating uh, spellcasting options whenever possible on monsters so that they can, again, make more sense. There's not a million things to keep track of. And then when they're not going to be spells, like Matt pointed out, they're going to be abilities that exist alongside a list of spells. Uh, it's all in an effort to make monsters more appealing to run different ones. And so instead of like just having a bunch of kobolds all the time, exploring what's actually out there, because there's a ton of monsters that you could possibly use throughout all of the books we have 
Uh, I mean, heck, the Fizzman's guy just released and had a bunch of other stuff that you could use in there as well. Uh, there's tons of creatures, and they're trying to encourage people to to feel safe enough to branch out and to sort of try new things while still giving DMs the sort of agency to be dangerous uh, and interesting and not forget things and make players actually have memorable encounters. It's I appreciate what they're trying to do. I just wish the book was available on its own right now. Uh, Liz, how long, when's the release date for it again? They have a standalone? May. May. It's in May. So that is a long time. It is a very long time. <laughs> it's forever. And yeah, I think part of this is uh, last year they did a book and they had to delay the physical release, I assume because of supply chain issues and like, and all of that. And so they went ahead with the digital release on time. So you had the digital release early and a bunch of people were like, Oh, you're favoring digital. Now we have to buy the digital copy and the physical copy. And so you had a lot of complaints like that. And now they've gone ahead and released it, but not released the digital edition. And I feel like, I feel like they're in a, like Hasbro is in a no win situation here. They're going to get complaints either way. I would have preferred they did the digital release, but either way, people are going to be unhappy. Yeah, and honestly, if seeing the the rush print job, I'd rather wait. I think a little bit personally, yeah, yeah, and make sure things are good. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, one of my favorite books that I've bought in recent years is the Van Richten's Guide, uh, and the and I got the special cover one. But even that special cover one, it's printed upside down and backwards. So, oh my gosh! So I absolutely, I oh. love it. I, it's perfectly readable, but I have to read right to left, <laughs> <laughs> and I have to turn the book upside down and 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 flip it around, which I don't mind. I think it's a great little like niche piece because it's still usable. Like everything is is fine inside of it. But like when there's pages missing and things are misspelled or uh, the double printed page thing, actually, and Matt will probably remember this. That used to be a problem in three point five when they were spitting out books every couple months. Yep. We, you would get runs. Uh, I think it was Player's Handbook Two was the first time I saw like a massive like printing error, and it was like the entire book was double printed, and that was not an uncommon Ooh. thing. So if you bought it from Media Play, you were almost guaranteed a company that no longer exists. Ah, uh, you were guaranteed almost to get it uh, as a double print all the way through if the first like three months. So it's not uncommon. Uh, but that was right when D and D was starting to get like popular again and they were rushing to meet demand. So, so hopefully yeah, um, I have the uh, Epic players handbook and the Epic players handbook that I have is it's a signed copy. It's one of the like couple hundred they had the, mm-hmm. the writer signed and sent out. Uh, it, it has an entire section on monsters that is printed twice. Like it just, you go through the section of monsters, then it goes like one more page and then there's the section of monsters again. It's just yeah. there again. And it's just, it just happened. You know, I, I, I kept it because quite frankly, I think it's pretty cool, but yeah, it is the kind of thing that happened quite a lot then. And it is, you, you are seeing it again now is kind of interesting. Although I don't think in this case, it's not because they're just, you know, dumping out books. I think it's because the, like you guys have said already, the, the, the situation globally is difficult. So, yeah. And it just goes to show that even the, the 9,000 pound gorilla in the room, it will even has problems with it. So like not everybody is, it's not just size erases the problem. Like some people would like to think. So it's, it's everyone folks. Uh, but moving away from D and D, uh, there was some Paizo news, which I thought Matt might be interested in, or he might even knew about it. Um, so they have a set of books coming out, the complete character chronicles. Do you know anything about that, Matt? No, I had not heard about it. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> I feel like a bad person because I just I had not kept up on this. I really I saw it in the email, but I haven't had time today to look at it. So yeah, I had no idea what they are. Yeah, it's actually um it's kind of cool, at least from what I from what I've seen of them, they look like character journals. Uh and they're basically and you re- record your character's journey from basically level one nothingness to heroic epicness, and it's got all the rules, spells, feats, abilities for your chosen class. Now there used to be this thing, and going back to like... It, we should point out it's a Beetle and Grimm publication. It's a Beetle and Grimm publication, yes. Yeah, so it's going to be like quality type stuff, uh, special pay, you know, special cover, special yeah. stuff inside. Uh, but back in the day, there used to be these these things called like the Complete Fighter, the Complete cl- uh, Cleric, the Complete Rogue. Uh, and that was around D&D 3rd edition-ish, 
uh, between three and three points where it was not just all of the current rules, but also alternate defeats, but also ways to record your character progress and sort of like pick what you were going through, almost like a choose your own adventure type thing so that you had a character portfolio that you carried with you. These seem to be doing that exact same thing in a nice hardbound book with special covers uh, where you can record everything from your feats, your abilities, all of your class rules are there. Um, your character sheet lives in a, a lovely little pocket. It looks like it's actually made out of really thick cardstock um, that does have some dry erase capabilities. It's actually really cool. Um, and I never realized how much I wanted one of these for D&D. <laughs> so uh, just something to kind of watch out for. Uh, yeah. But see. no, I'm sorry. I haven't been keeping up on it. Oh, no worries. I just thought it was interesting. I thought I'm gonna, I'd throw some Paizo I'm still waiting. There. I'm still waiting for Paizo to get their, uh, their um, D&D Beyond competition out quite frankly that's the thing i'm most waiting for from them we haven't heard anything about that recently have we no it was they said sometime in the beginning of this year they were going to start rolling out the character creation part and that's the last i heard of it and i think that's one of those games you know why don't you explain why i think that the or why you i don't even know if you agree and i'm, I'm sorry i'm sort of like stumbling over my words a little bit character creation in pathfinder is always a little bit weird and I think the digital tools would be like really good to to have available and might actually entice more people to play it. Do you think that's the case? I wouldn't say it's weird. Uh, the thing about Pathfinder, especially now that it's Pathfinder second edition is it isn't the original Pathfinder, which was a 3.5 clone. Uh, they have changed the game. The, the, the game is still recognizably a D and D descendant, but it is not the same as it was. It's I, I, I I've seen one person describing it as it's, it's, it's very interestingly hybridized between fourth edition and 3.5. It's got some stuff that feels a lot like D and D fourth edition, which is not surprising because some of the people they hired to work on it were the people behind fourth edition, like Logan Bonner uh, is one example. He's one of the people who went over to Paizo and is working on, on Pathfinder now. Um, so that's one thing about it. it. It's generally, it's more, a lot of the stuff that you see D and D doing now is stuff Pathfinder did two years ago. Uh, the thing about, making it so you can play pretty much any race for mm -hmm. any class that's from pathfinder pathfinder got to the point where they don't even call them races anymore pathfinder is like your, your ancestry who you're descended from but they don't call it a race um and they very much they did it diff they did it differently than uh than D, D did but they did a whole thing where you basically could play you want to play a, a dwarf wizard yeah sure that's not a problem uh, they totally set it up so that it works just fine. And they they came up with stuff like, for instance, one of the things that they did for, for Pathfinder, that second edition that I really like is, say you want to play a tiefling. In D&D, tiefling is its own race. In Pathfinder, it's not. You could play a dwarf tiefling or a elf tiefling or a, you know, your ancestry and then things like tiefling aren't an ancestry there, there's something that's in your bloodline that you've inherited that can can manifest, and it can manifest. So you could have an Asimar elf or an Asimar dragonborn if they had dragonborn in, in Pathfinder, which they don't. But it could be like an Asimar lizard person. You, that's part of the thing. But but ultimately, what ends up happening is Pathfinder is significantly crunchier than D and D is. D and D fifth edition is and. It doesn't feel this way if you see people playing it sometimes, but it is actually pretty simplified from previous D and Ds. Uh, they they got rid of a lot of stuff to make it easier to run. Uh, Pathfinder is actually not hard to run. They came up with the three action economy thing, which is just brilliant. I love it, but it is a lot more math to make a character in Pathfinder, and that's why I think that the Nexus is going to be brilliant because that's the one thing D and D Beyond takes care of. Like you don't have to sit down and do all that math. It's done for you. That's what Pathfinder desperately needs. Uh, so that's just to me, that is why it's such an important thing. That's why I'm so interested in it happening. And the character creation aspect of it is my most needed thing. Um, but I, I don't, we'll see what happens when it actually comes out. It, right now, I believe that it is not, it's not here yet. The character management thing is, I'm looking at the site right now. They've got the, you know, digital um, reader for the, so you can have the various rule books. They've got the game compendium so you can know what the rules are, but they don't have the character management thing up yet. And that to me is like, I'd love to run Pathfinder right now, but I don't want to have to sit down and make everybody's character for them. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's some stuff in Pathfinder that I'd really like to get to, to get to play with you guys to get you to see it. Like, I think that they've, what they've done, the three action economy is just so much better. 
And if we had time, I would talk about it, but I don't think we really want to spend 20 minutes talking about that. So <laughs> for now, I will let that go. But that's that's my take on it. That's what I think Nexus is so important. Yeah, and I think I think anything that lowers the barrier for people to play your game is a good move, uh, personally. So, And I think that the crunchy nature of it does turn people off to it. I know it has kind of pushed me away from it, despite I, I've played it. I like Starfinder. Um, I like... I like stuff that Paizo puts out, but it's not going to be my first thing I grab off the shelf. But if they have a digital thing that handles all the the minutia for me, that makes it a lot more viable. So I'm with you on that. Uh, All right. So I think we'll spend some time here. I think we've covered enough of the news or some of the bigger items that are happening right now. I think we're going to talk about what's coming up for our game. Now, we just had our session zero. Uh, If you haven't listened to it, it should be available right now, wherever our fine podcasts are available. And we've just started puzzling out how everybody knows each other and the character backstories. Um, Matt and I kind of have an idea of what we're going to do for ours. Matt, do you want to talk about it a little bit or, or do you want? Sure. To, Absolutely yeah. not. No problem. Um, I'm going to be running the first game. Mm-hmm. And so Joe will be playing first. So Joe and I ha- decided since we're going to be like both of us running games, we need a character. That, like the first idea was that we would each have a character and we would just switch off. But then we're like, what if we played the same character? And then that was like, but then we'd have to come up with character conception we both like. And then I don't remember who it was. Might have been Joe, might have been me. Said, but what if it was actually two different characters in the same body? And that's when the light bulb went off and we we're like, ooh, okay. And that's when we started talking. Like I, I had a character I wanted to play for a long time. Uh, I actually got to play it very briefly. And it was a it was a Warforged Paladin. And the reason I liked it was because I just, I like like playing Warforged. They're kind of fun. It's like, you kind of get to be a fantasy version of a robot and it's kind of cool, but it's not quite the same thing. And Joe's had a, a Warforged character in, in the game that Liz is running the, uh, the candle keep game that she, she runs on Fridays when, you know, life lets us have it. Mm, and maybe next week. Yeah. Maybe we can next give it week. a try, but he couldn't keep playing because of, you know, time time stuff. So he hasn't been able to play that character, but he really liked it. So he wanted to play it. It was a, I believe it was a originally going to be a cleric, but now it's going to be a bard. Yeah, it was a cleric. So yeah, but now it's going to be a bard. And he, so he wanted to play that. And we're like, if we played these different characters, how do we like, why, why are there two of them in this one body? And we're like, what if there's more than two? Yeah. And what that if there's a up, whole bunch of stuff in there. And that opens us up to like, okay, I'm bored of, pa- of, of bard or I'm bored of paladin right now, or we don't need it. The party doesn't need it. Yeah. Why don't we do this instead? And all of a sudden, another another soul steps forward and takes the driver's seat, which I thought was fun. And which has then given us ideas for the campaign because we we're setting up, we're trying to make everybody's ideas work. Uh, like everyone's character as he did. Like like Liz has this really cool idea for a, a character who is a dragonborn who is raising a baby dragon and using the the new dragon. Uh, I don't know what's called Drake the the Drake, uh, Drake, Drake Warden. Warden. Drake, Drake Warden. Warden. Yeah, the Drake Warden uh, Ranger class from from Tasha's. Not from Tasha's, from the Dragon Book, uh, Fizzman's, uh, Fizzman's, Fizzman's Treasury. Yeah, yeah. So th- that's a really cool Ranger class. It, it actually fixes a lot of the problems that Rangers have, but we can still play around with it and and have it be a baby dragon instead of the Drake. And there's there's ways to do it that we thought were really cool. So we, we're we're Liz's character concept gave us some ideas. Uh, Anne's character concept of this Drow Druid is really cool and weird. And we like, yeah, that we like this, this works. And we already had these elves we'd come up with who are like, not your typical elves. They're like, they, and not, no, you know, no, you know, this sounds, that sounds like, you know, I'm not your normal girl sort of thing. And it, it's not like that. We're, we, 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 I want, we had this idea of trying not to do the typical high fantasy stuff with elves, yeah. which tend to be very magical or very like ethereal. We live in the trees and we, you know, the, we wanted elves who get their hands dirty. So we like this whole group of what we call the hammerkin elves, who are like into smithing and mining and material gathering and all that stuff. Um, And so that's one thing we're doing. And we think we can tie them into all these elf PCs we've got going. Yeah. And I think it'll be, it'll, it's something that'll work uh, really well, at least for where we're at. Um, And I want to throw this over to Liz right now because Liz uh, just gave us her backstory. And I figure uh, instead of us talking about your character, you're here. Tell us about (laughs) it. Talk about your character, what you're looking forward to uh, with, you know, what you've got set up and, and things that are, are interesting to you. Well, really, it started with uh, getting Fizzman's Treasury of Dragons. And I was just, I can play a class that has a pet dragon. Oh, yeah. Ah, I have to do this. Um, so I kind of started from that point and worked backwards. 
Um, I don't know if that's a great way to create a character, but yeah, I started with the subclass I wanted to be, and I've sort of worked backwards from there. Uh, but the idea, the Drake Warden is supposed to have like a spiritual connection with dragons, and they can summon this like, not an actual Drake, but like, it's like the spiritual representation. I don't know. It's not like an actual dragon that they're supposed to have. But uh, I had this idea that there's kind of these folk traditions about worshipping dragons or revering dragons. And there are these dragons who live up in the mountains. And like, what if she lives up in this village up where the dragons are? And, you know, they're kind of around dragons every day, but something terrible happens. And she escapes this terrible thing. And she has a literal dragon egg. She's like saved one egg. Um... And she's, you know, you have a dragon egg. Eventually, you have a baby dragon. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I asked uh, Matt and Joe if, okay, well, what if I have an actual dragon? And they just said yes. They said yes. So <laughs> gonna, here yeah, we are. We're, we're just going to use the rules for the Drake Warden, and we'll just say instead of summoning yeah. it, it's just a baby dragon. Uh, it, that's no big deal. It's the kind of thing where if somebody comes up with an idea that's cool, and you can easily just use the rules you have, you don't have to worry about it, and then why not just do it? Yeah, I see, don't see a problem with it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's mostly just it's reskinning the Drake Warden and not even a whole lot. It's just like a little bit. Uh, except, yeah, now I have like a dumb baby dragon that doesn't know how to be a dragon that I get to drag around. But, you know, I I had the idea from the subclass and I'm like, OK, well, she lives in this town with dragons. What would that be like? And I sort of, you know, it spun off into this whole idea. Well, it's a town way up in the mountains. It's kind of isolated. Not everyone knows about it. Uh, well, they have to be like self-sufficient. There are probably a lot of rangers, maybe a lot of druids. You know, it just sort of catapulted into like building out this whole place just because I'm like, I want to play the subclass. And then it turned into like 27 other things from that. And uh, it was pretty recently, like late in developing this that I thought, well, you know, she's she's kind of older. She's not she's not a kid. She's not hasn't just like stumbled into this. She's been here for a while. She's been around. She's well traveled. Um, and then I started thinking, well, you know, she lives in a town. She has a family. And like I started developing out that. And it's like she she has a husband. She has kids. I mean, she's in her 40s, maybe early 50s. She's she has all of this stuff. And uh when you give a DD character a family, I think that's I think that's kind of dangerous when you just hand your DMs <laughs> a family. Yeah, yeah, it is sometimes. Uh, sometimes, but 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 also, I think most of them are already dead. Because the village was destroyed, so it's probably fine. Probably fine. They're already gone. No big deal. Well, no, they're they're still alive. They're, yeah. <laughs> if, if nothing, if, if nothing else, you haven't been up there. You don't know. You don't know the state of things. You just know that a big evil dragon came in and took away uh, took away everything you loved. Uh, yeah, yeah. I destroyed the town. I mean, she saw like the smoldering ruins of the town, and you know, she didn't see anything that looked good. And uh, no one's come down the mountain since she came down with her dragon egg. So she's pretty sure everyone's dead. That's just the logical conclusion. Uh, but yeah, it started with the subclass and I worked backwards and it just turned into this whole this whole thing. And uh, Matt and Joe just said yes to everything. I, I actually kind of like the idea because most people w have worked in a traditional way and like creating characters for so long that they don't work any other way as far as character creation goes so you don't think about so, other ways that you could do it and i thought yours was so interesting. i have i have a question what would you consider the traditional way of making a character so if you were to follow like let's say use D, D beyond as like the example right so you the way that it works is sort of how the books have been for time and memoriam at this point where you pick a, a race then you get stats then you pick a class then maybe you pick a subclass if you're a high enough level and then you you go into like gear and equipment. Um, so like picking up the class or subclass is usually one of the last steps. Uh, and it's not a lot used to be informed like back in second edition and, and, and earlier uh, what your stats were. So like you didn't know what classes you could be until you figured out what stats you actually had. Hmm. And so like you used to have minimum requirements. You couldn't be a wizard if your intelligence was too low. You couldn't be a, a ranger or a rogue if your dex was too low. Um, you couldn't be a fighter or a barbarian if your your strength was too low or constitution. There, there was yeah. all sorts of weird requirements back then. And Matt can talk well, plus, a little bit more about that. 
Yeah. Plus, I mean, one of the things about D and D is that there were editions of D and D where, in order to be, say, a bard, you had to play a fighter and then play a druid and then play a wizard. Mm-hmm. Like, not a wizard. I think it was a rogue. Actually, that just just ridiculous. You had to like play fighter, one class. Fighter, rogue, wizard. Yeah, it was just nuts. Um, and those legacies still hold on. They're still present in the game, even though that like nowadays you just play a bard. It's still that that weird idea of like, okay, if you don't have the high enough stats, you can't multi-class into this class. Ironically, D and D right now does not have a rule against having extremely low stats and starting in a class. You could play a six int wizard. You could do it. It's going to really not work. Like it's going to. This is not optimal, but you could do it right now. Like you could roll it. There's no rule in it saying you have to have a high int to play a wizard. But you couldn't multi-class in a wizard with a six int. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but it it is interesting. The, the the fact that you picked your class first mm-hmm. is fairly unusual for how most people assume you're going to go. And I think, and I think it's everything Joe hangover, said is right? usually, yeah. yeah, it's, it's hangover from back in the day. You didn't even know if you'd get to play that class. Like <laughs> there were, there were ability minimums to even get into classes, not just like pretty much every class. Like if you wanted to play a fighter, a fighter was like the most vanilla class possible. You still had to be like a 13. Like if you go back and look at blue box D and D, uh, not only was, was like, there's to play an elf. Cause, and keep in mind, there was a time when elf, and dwarf and halfling were classes. Yeah, yep. not not races. The, first first wanted, edition, first edition D and D. The races, the, the what we some of the, what we consider races were just straight up classes. Yeah, I wouldn't even call it first edition D and D. I'd call it like the blue box stuff. Sure, like what they call the BECMI, uh, basic expert companion, master immortals uh, rules. They they straight up. If you played, you wanted to play D and D. If you played a fighter, uh, a magic user, a thief, or a cleric, you were playing a human. And then if you wanted to play an elf or a dwarf or a halfling, like an elf was basically both a fighter and a magic user, Mm -hmm. but they could only go to level eight. um, And it took them twice as long to get a level because obviously they could do two things at once. Uh, Dwarf, again, only I think got up to level 10, but dwarf was basically just a fighter. Yep. But with better con dwarf. Yeah. With a better con. And then halflings were like rogues or thieves, but, they also kind of had some special stuff and again you could only get up to like level nine or ten. And and interestingly enough, so like some of the stuff that you look in the fifth edition books now for those like races, like if you were to like read them and some of the racial abilities um uh, that that are now like I guess lineage of custom lineage abilities as well, uh they're those are carryovers from those uh those older books. So yeah, like absolutely. Halflings being able to move through occupied spaces has existed forever because they were always supposed to be small. Um, yeah, they were so short. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a thing. But as a result of that, yeah, people tend to be used to doing it like, okay, what are you going to play? Well, I want to, you know, although I will say this, a lot of people, whenever I ask, what do you want to play? They often come up with a class first. So that's not that unusual, but it's usually the other way. The, the game is set up to encourage you to go the other way. Mm-hmm. I think it's great to come in and say, you know, I want to play X and just go from yes. there and just reverse engineer it. I think that's awesome. I have no problem with that. And that's why I wanted to bring up like how Liz created her character because I think it's it's refreshing, right? And it's it's something I'd like to encourage more because I've I've run so many tables where people don't think about their class until way later, and sometimes they haven't given it enough thought, so they get I don't want to say get bored with it, but it's not quite what they envisioned or it's not running the way that they wanted it to. And not that any way of approaching your character creation is wrong. I just think being open to multiple different ways. Like if you decide I want to play a half work and everything and that nothing else matters or, or that is the primary drive, that's fine. If you decide I want to play this class with this subclass in mind. That's also fine. It's I, I just really appreciated Liz that you didn't fall into that standard pattern of, you know, race stats class, hmm. which I th- like, one of the things was we're starting at level three and I, which is when uh, Rangers happen to get their subclasses. And I like, I wasn't sure if we were going to be starting lower level and I had this idea, well, okay, she's not a Drake ward yet, but she's carrying around this egg, which I think that would have been really cool and possibly hilarious, just carrying around an egg and getting into trouble. Uh, but we are starting at level three. So she has, we're past that egg phase. <laughs> Well, I might actually do the egg hatching as the opening. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be fun. But yeah, I one of the things about 
D&D that currently I, that I wish they hadn't done is they have not put everyone's subclass at the same level. Most most yeah, classes weird. get theirs at third, but clerics get theirs at first. I think warlocks yeah. do too, don't they? Warlocks get yeah. theirs at first. Clerics get theirs at first. Everybody else yeah. I think really is third. And I don't like that. I feel like you should be able to just start with your your subclass because they make the subclass so important to your class. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you have to like, you know, it's not something that you can do as a fighter. Like if you want to play an Eldritch Knight as a fighter, you have to like work to have the intel, Ooh. you know, and it's just. I mean, look at, look at, uh, sorry, not to interrupt, but like you're, you're raising a good point. It also unbalances certain things as well. So like uh, war domain of war clerics are stupid good. At as, first level, yes, at, absolutely. At first and second level, because they can use their bonus action to make extra attacks in melee when every other class can't do that. No, I know. I played a war cleric uh, in a campaign. We got to level three. It was level three that everybody else started catching up. Up mm-hmm. until level twenty two, <laughs> I was, I was heads and shoulders above everybody else on damage because I could just one thing: war clerics can use any bloody weapon they want. Because mm-hmm, they're like a warrior. Yeah, two, they can do a bonus attack. Like, it, you can only do it a certain amount of times per day. Like, I think it was like five times a day because it was my, your, it's, well, I think it was actually up to five by the time it, someone else came in. Isn't it based on your whiz bonus? Uh, you know what? It might be, but either way, uh, it, it's, yeah. it's, an, it's, a, it's enough to make a difference. Oh, it's a big difference. Like, cause you'll, you'll just do it. Cause you, I think you can get it back on a long rest. So mm, yeah, why yes. not? Why wouldn't you? you just, just use it up. What's, what's the reason not to? And yeah, up until third level when, you know, fi- actually for fighters, it's fifth level. Uh, fifth level is when fighters get their extra attack. That's when most people get an extra attack, get it. So yeah, up until that, the war cleric is, is a beast. They're just crazy strong. It, so um, this, this actually, I'll, I'll pose a question to you guys since we're coming up on time. This is something that I feel kind of strongly about. I, I think that the first couple levels of D and D in particular, like starting at level one, is something that really at this point is more geared towards new players and new DMs that maybe haven't played before. And I think that the game is really like that. It does actually really start and should actually really start just at third level, because then you have everybody on the same footing. Everybody has a subclass. Everybody has a specialty. uh, Everybody starts getting into the more interesting things of their classes. And if you've played a few games, you understand the basic mechanics, which to me is really the only purpose of those lower levels at this point is to teach the basic mechanics of actual gameplay. Uh, or am I thinking about this wrong? Is this something you guys agree with or disagree with? You have to go first, Liz. I, I don't have any real strong feelings here. I do agree with both of y'all that having the subclasses at different levels kind of is a power disruption because subclasses cross the board add really cool features. And subclasses can be a huge part of character identity because there is a big difference between uh, like a peace domain cleric and a war domain cleric. They just have a completely different kind of philosophy and way of looking at things. And it makes sense that clerics have their domains from day one because, you know, you're choosing, you're going in and choosing to worship a certain god. That's kind of, that's your whole thing. You're worshiping a certain god, a certain type of god, and that's your identity from the beginning. But if a fighter is going to be an eldritch knight, that's different than just a standard kind of sword and board warrior. That's not the same at all. You're doing different training. You're doing different work from day one if you want to be an eldritch knight. So, But you uh, you don't get the benefit of it for two levels. Yeah, and that's just yeah. Weird. So it, yeah, it does feel weird. And also, characters at first level really, really squishy. It is mm-hmm. hard to play with characters at first level. See, I actually feel weird about this because I, I think that first level works would work better if everyone got their subclass. I would just, yeah. I would, if I were rewriting D and would give everyone the subclass at first level because that's just when I would do it. But I actually don't like. I don't mind doing first and second level. In fact, I think there's a really a lot of good reasons to do it. One of the reasons isn't just for new players. It's to put, it's to get your players thinking about what it's like to be fragile because you are going to be practically a God by like 10th level compared to the average person. A 10th level member of any class is ridiculously powerful. Oh yeah. No, at at 10th level, I did 340 damage to an adult black dragon in one turn. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's a huge difference between you and that villager. 
Mm-hmm. Even at first level, you're you're way tougher than that villager. A villager can be probably be killed with two points of damage. Yeah, technically, technically, I think <clears throat> that's the old chainmail thing, right? So like commoners yeah. and people that don't have a class are considered. Th- there's no actual rule for it, but it's like unspoken rule that they're level zero, right? They don't have specialties. Yeah. They don't have class. They're just they're just normal. And you even your wizard who's like you know will die from a paper cut is like way more hardy than the average person he's going to run into, Mm -hmm. especially if they have a high con or what have you. It's just interesting to put people through first and second level so that they, they like, I I believe I remember watching a, it must've been critical role. I don't remember which one it was, but I remember watching one who was like, ah, yeah, level one when his wizard got taken out of a fight, like just like that, (laughs) that's, I like it when players get to have that experience, not because I want to kill them. I go out of my way to not kill people unless I absolutely have to. I do. That is not something I want to do. Uh, d- different DMs, different feelings about it. But for me, if a player dies, uh, unless it's something where they died because they were like, no, everyone get through the portal. I'm going to stay here and defend it. And they want to have an epic death that that's cool. And I will help them do that. But otherwise I don't, I don't like it. If I won't cheat for it, but I will play a certain way to to give players the absolute maximum chance of success because I'm not here to beat you. I'm I'm here to lose to you very convincingly. To to quote <laughs> one of my favorite game design quotes. Yeah. Um. But I do like that players get to have that first and second level experience. But I don't want some players to do it on easy mode, like a warlock or a or a cleric, where it's just like. Yeah, I'm first level, but I can already do this and this and this. Whereas it's like you you mentioned fighters like the Eldritch Knight or the Battlemaster, which you didn't mention, but the Battlemaster has all this cool stuff, but they don't get it till third level. Um, or they're the champion fighter, which is literally just I crit more often. And you think that's dumb and, and boring, but I crit more often is a huge, huge deal. Thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I rolled or, a nineteen, you or, know, so I crit, you know. Or, or let's, or we can talk about the cavalier who was like, oh no, now that wizard who has like paper AC and no health, congratulations, you're just not hitting them ever again. Like you, yeah. Like there, there's some really cool, interesting interactions that start to happen later on, and yeah, I would agree. I, I think I agree. Like I think if they had stuff like that at first level for everybody, I think it'd be a little bit different. Or if mm-hmm. they took, I, I hate to say this this way because it, it, I don't like taking things away from players but moving some of the more specialized stuff away from first level for those other classes to third level to bring parity. I do think I do think it makes sense for clerics and warlocks to have their stuff at first level. Sure. Because like like Liz said, if you are a, a war cleric, you are a very different cleric than if you are a peace cleric or a life cleric or a, you know a, a grave cleric. Or quite frankly, if you're a grave cleric, welcome to being the most powerful cleric in existence. <laughs> they are crazy good. But it makes sense that you'd be that you've picked a God. Like you can't have two levels of like, you know, Oh, I don't know who I'm going to be a cleric of. You know what I mean? Like you kind of yeah. have a God up front or sometimes you just worship a force or what have you, but still you, th- there's a, there's a relationship there. So I don't necessarily want to take that away from them. I think it would make more sense just to have everybody do it. Um, and just design them. So you don't front load with like the most powerful abilities at first level. Like if you're, you know, at first level, you get one thing. You get this one cool thing and that's it instead of like, that's, the, I think the war cleric is kind of nuts at first level. A war cleric is nuts. Yeah. Any weapon you they, want plus that extra attack is pretty. Mm. And any armor you want and any armor. Yes. Yeah. You, you can be waddling around in plate mail. A lot of people do a one level cleric dip, take war cleric. So that they can and do then, that. Yeah. And, and then they're busted for four levels, you know, and it's, I knew a rogue who did that. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> what are you nuts? But it's like, yeah, no, it works perfect. You, you know what? I'm going to say this. I, I think, cause we're, we're, we're kind of at time. Mm-hmm. I think this is the one thing that fourth edition did better than all the other editions. And I yeah, don't think it I gets enough credit you. for that. Yeah, like, I would pe- agree. Fourth edition did, did really well with the concept of pow- how power escalated over time and how your character leveled up. I would totally agree with you. And even then it handled first level better because of the everyday abilities, the once a day abilities and the, the way that it was, cause your character got those to start. Like you mm-hmm. got, you got a piece of power at level one. And a lot of people clown on fourth edition because it was, you know, video game esque, but it really did this. The it's the only one of D and D that has done this properly. I think ever. And it's the, it, people don't sing its praise nearly enough as far as that goes. No, for that I, I would event. agree with that. 
I would agree with that. Liz has not played it, so it's not really fair. But. No. <laughs> we should, you know, one of these days, we should, you and I, I know we have the books. We should run a fourth edition game for people <laughs> just to. Yeah, I mean, I'd be willing to. I do have the books. So, uh, but Liz, but any, yeah. part, any parting thoughts or anything like that? Uh, no, I'm looking forward to where this uh, game goes that we're working on. I'm looking forward to it as well, especially since I think we decided our character imprinted on you uh, since you found us. So this is going to be really, <laughs> really interesting. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you very much, folks. Uh, Blizzard Watch is made possible due to the generous contributions at patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch. Your continued support means this podcast site and community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to the podcast, a better chance at having your question answered on our podcast or the queue, and an ads-free site experience. Uh, and as always, a reminder that those of us at Blizzard Watch stand with the employees of basically everywhere in demanding better work environments, safer work environments, uh, fair treatment, uh, and at this point, just hacking unionize. We support that as well. Uh, make sure you protect yourselves out there, folks. Uh, but with that, folks, we'll see you next time. Be sure to stay tuned for our upcoming. We, I think we have two Into the Weirs games coming this month. Uh, where we're just waiting. Uh, yeah, we, Godless. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do two if y'all can do two. Right. I think so. Yeah, and we're just working on details on timing uh, so that time may shift. There are things working in the background that might cause us to to move things around, but we're going to try to do them for you. Um, and if you have questions or, or for any of our podcasts, be sure to send them into us. Uh, you can send them into podcast at blizzardwatch.com. We have been receiving items for Tavern Watch uh, as far as like questions and topics. We're going to start getting into those in the future episodes. Uh, we just wanted to cover some of the news and talk a little bit about Into the Weirs coming up since, well, it's literally coming up this month. So but with that, folks, uh, I think we'll see you next time. 